Great. Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Friday, February 26th, and we're going to start with a, a quick walkthrough of H-195, use of facial recognition technology by law enforcement in cases involving sexual exploitation of children. And uh, attorney Michelle Childs is going to do a very quick uh, walkthrough of the changes um, that we will be voting on. However, I will wait for the committee discussion and vote um, until later, uh, most likely this afternoon, um, given I wanna be able to get to H183 and, um, and have um, Attorney Childs walk us through that before, um, before she needs to go. So good morning, welcome. Thank you, Michelle. Good morning, thanks. So um, can everybody see my screen? The draft up there? Okay, so it is a uh, version 3.1. And uh, the two substantive changes here are uh, it adds the word identified on line 19. So that was something that witnesses discussed in their last hearing, saying that they would be more comfortable if, uh, when it refers to the suspect, that you're talking about an identified suspect. Um, and then the other change is that this only applies to cases involving investigations of sexual exploitation of children. So those other crimes, um, and you get around with the concept of um, encompassing other crimes as long as the those other crimes were discovered through an initial investigation to sexual child sexual exploitation, and so that's been removed. But the other elements of the proposal are the same as before. So it's creating a carve out to the moratorium that was passed last year. Um, and it's specifically the use of this technology in, in cases where there's an investigation into sexual exploitation of children. Um, the search has to be solely confined to locating images, including videos um, uh, of that individual within electronic media legally seized by law enforcement in relationship to the specific investigation. And you'll see also that I had changed the, the title there. So after passage, it will change um, to show that it's more limited than it was introduced. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Oh. Any questions for Michelle about the language? It's hard for me to see hands. Uh, Tom. Imagine, imagine yeah. that, mine's up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Michelle, I, again, it, it's one of those questions I know the answer to. So uh, with the new language, uh, of course, uh, facial recognition can be used only with uh, exploitation of children, but can uh, a crime, another crime that is uh, discovered while doing this can still be investigated? Um, you mean like, so that they're investigating it, they're investigating child sexual exploitation and then they, they find another crime? Yes. Want to explore? Yeah, but I would, I would say I would talk to, to, the, to the folks who are uh, the prosecutors who are, who are working with us to see how they would handle that with regard to evidence discovered through the use of, of, of the technology. Right. Uh, okay. And uh, say if that is uh, permissible, uh, so investigating that crime going forward, uh, facial recognition cannot be used. Yes, correct. Okay, great, yep. thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, I'm gonna switch over to the other draft if that's okay with y'all, cause I have just, do yeah. have to go at 11.30, but, um, I can try to I'll communicate with the chair and I'm in another committee this afternoon, but I can maybe pop back and forth um, if, if that works. So Thank you, Michelle. I'm to look at, at the amendment to H183 and, um, and a lot of these changes were made based on listening to the, uh, to the discussion and the, com the committee testimony last time. And then also some discussion amongst prosecutors about potential refinement of some of the language. And so just as an individual instance of amendment, depending on where you wanna go, next time I could do a strike all if it's easier for you. But um, so we just start off with the first instance of amendment and it is amending the first three sections of the bill. The first one is in section one, the definition section. So you see the definition of consent 
And so the previous version said uh, it added the word knowing and it added the word and, so it would be a knowing and voluntary agreement. So that and has been changed to an or at the request of the state's attorneys and the attorney general's office. And so um, because I'm limited time, are um, issues that they're going to discuss if we can just I, they can they're going to testify and so they can talk to you about why they would prefer this language if that's okay. Um, well, well, one eighty three is enough. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so it's not up. What is up? One ninety five. <laughs> oh, because I see one eighty three on my oh. screen. Uh, I've never okay. I think you have to stop share and then share again. Um, okay, I shall try that. It was a nice discussion, you know. I, <laughs> well, thanks for stopping me. I think I have it. Do you see it now? Yes, yes. Okay, great. I think that's Thank the you. thing is I think you have to stop. You can't just switch the document. Maybe you have to get out of the chair and start again. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. So we're looking at page one of the amendment draft uh, 1.2. And so you'll see there on line 13, changing the and to an or. Then on lines 15 through 18, I've added the definition of incapable of consenting. And so when we go down to another section, I'll show you where that's used as an element of the crime. Um, this definition is from Title 10, the military, the federal military code that we discussed in, at the last meeting about a lot of this language is taken from there. So incapable of consenting means that the person is incapable of appraising the nature of the conduct at issue or physically incapable of declining participation in or communicating unwillingness to engage in the sexual act at issue. So again, that's taken directly from federal law. Section two. Um, the amendment here, subsection B, and so the subdivision B1 addresses the issue uh, that is in current law, which is in a situation where someone administers an, uh, an intoxicant to someone without their knowledge or consent and then engages in a sexual act. That's not changed. Subdivision, there, subdivision two addresses a circumstance where um, it's prohibiting a person from engaging in a sexual act with another person when the other person, and here's the, the term, and that was in the previous version, incapable of consenting. So we go back up to that definition, to the sexual act due to, and we added the word substantial to, the, to impairment by alcohol, drugs, or other intoxicants. And that condition is known or reasonably should be known by the person. So here we're adding the word substantial. There were concerns at the last hearing about what, um, by not having the word substantial, uh, did, could, could it be argued that uh, if you engage in sex with someone who's, um, you know, had, had a bit to drink, but isn't in necessarily incapable of consenting, is it, is it uh, um, difficult to ascertain in those circumstances? And so I think there were comfortable with adding the word substantial. And you'll see that up in the current law on B in subsection B where it's talking about impairment is that they do use the word under current law um, substantial to define intoxication, but that's been removed in the situation where you have somebody administering drugs to someone without their consent. So the substantial is taken out there, but then it's added into subdivision B2. Something that's not here is there was in the bill is introduced a provision here around um, engaging in a sexual act uh, with someone who has a uh, psychological or intellectual disability that has been taken out. And I think I'll, the prosecutors will talk to you about why they would prefer that, but is um, uh, there after in title 13, uh, the provision of um, of, of penalties for sexual crimes involving vulnerable adults. And they thought that it might be a little too confusing to have those two there. So they recommended the eliminating it here under subsection. So that is out for now. 
Section three, the change here is where he, section three is dealing with, uh, with what constitutes and doesn't constitute consent. So subdivision four, the language that was there um, addressed issues of that a previous dating or sexual relationship or the way that the, the victim was dressed um, does in no way uh, affects the issue of consent. Um, we have a provision, we have a rape shield law and existing law. And so I did include the previous language in subdivision four, just kind of as belts and suspenders. Um, but again, uh, prosecutors felt as though they would prefer there just to be a reference back to the rape shield law. So that's what we did here. So consent shall not be demonstrated by evidence prohibited under section 3255. And that's it for the criminal offenses. The last change is in section five, and this is in the intercollegiate um, study, the intercollegiate sexual violence council. And there was a recommendation that uh, you add two more members to that council. So one being a sexual assault nurse examiner um, appointed by the network. And then the other recommendation was that a prosecutor sit on the council and it could either be from the Department of State's attorney or the office of the attorney general, but I wasn't sure who would necessarily be the appointing authority because as you know, normally we'll say, you know, a state's attorney appointed by the ED or someone from the attorney general's office appointed by the attorney general. So you'll have to think about who you would want to appoint since it's two different departments. And those are the only changes for now. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. So committee members, uh, and I also see we have um, lead sponsor representative Sarah Copeland Hans is here. So Sarah, I'm um, looking to you also as a honorary committee member today for purposes of questions. And um, it's hard for me to see because of a uh, screen sharing. So if I don't see your hand, can, do you want um, me to jump in? I'll stop sharing. Okay. All right. Great. Um, so Tom, your hand is up, but I think that's probably from before. Uh, Bob. Yes. One quick question. As I'm learning, word or words seem to be very important as we as we go through our, our review of these things. On line 21, Michelle. Is there, a, a, not to, to, to cloud the issue here, under substantial, is there a definition for that or is that just common sense substantial or what are we referring to? There is not a definition. You would use a, a, a plain, plain language meaning for substantial. And obviously there is some subjectivity built into that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Michelle? Uh, Selena, there you go. I just had a further question on the um, building off of Representative Norris's question on the addition of substantial. Is that something that has, is that language that's been interpreted by courts that you're aware of in, the, in relationship to this particular provision? Um, I'd have to look, because it is used in the existing law with regard to uh, drugging someone and then having sex with them, I could look and see whether or not that was addressed. But I, I think, you know, some of the practitioners might have some insight into that. Thank you. Martin. Yeah, that, that issue of substantial, it, it seems like it's defined within that provision itself. It's substantial if that leads to the person being incapable of consent. Right. Don't you have to right. look at the whole provision there in its entirety? Right, right. So you're saying you wouldn't, by, by requiring that the person be incapable of consenting, that that implies substantial? Right, right. Right. I, I certainly see your point. I was trying to incorporate the recommendations of the state's attorneys and the attorney general's office. And so in terms of why they think uh, it would be better to be in there, I would direct that question to them. Thank you. 
Any other hands? I'm not seeing it. Um, okay, Michelle, before I let you go, Sarah, mm -hmm. um, I wanna make sure you don't have any questions or anything for Michelle before we let her go. No, thank you so much for sharing the, the draft and, and thank you all to the committee for your great work on this bill. I appreciate it. Great, thank you. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Michelle. Uh, so let's turn to um, State's Attorney Rory Tebow. Great, good morning, welcome. Good morning, thank you for having me. It's a beautiful day here in Barrie. Uh, I wish everyone could be outside and sit on committee work, but here we are. Uh, but it's an important topic and uh, I appreciate um, Michelle's flexibility in responding incredibly rapidly to um, some changes. Unfortunately, uh, David and uh, Dominica and I couldn't get together until later in the week to uh, do a deep dive into what were some, not necessarily concerns, but just ways that, that we felt that uh, would improve uh, the overall bill. So I'll start right away in acknowledging that I think it was Representative Knott who raised the question about um, what's the distinction between two people who are drunk and having intercourse, is that you know, going to be illegal or would that be captured in the statute? Of course, the answer to that is no. And I think that's part of the reason why there's a rationale to include the term substantial. Uh, I agree with uh, Representative Lalonde that it is to be read in the entirety of the statutory text and what that means. But I think the main effort is to ensure that uh, courts and prosecutors who are you know, applying this law to a particular charge are cognizant that it is an elevated and a very high level of an intoxication or impact from a drug or something else that really does impair or inhibit the ability to make a free or conscious or voluntary uh, choice. So that, that's reflective of you know, the necessarily high standard uh, that needs to, to be there. Um, with that said, um, the incorporation of the additional definition section about including the term incapable of consenting uh, also tends to uh, clarify that uh, as to what is implied or meant by that degree of uh, impairment or incapacity in that circumstance. So I think that hopefully answers the question. And one of our concerns, of course, is this. While we want to have um, a good solid statute that captures the right amount of criminal uh, conduct, we also want to make sure that there is clarity and that we're not overreaching or creating an issue where the statute's overly broad in capturing people who should not be subject to criminal liability. I think that's paramount to confidence in the system that we strike the right balance in those definitions. Um, so um, the next, I'll just go through the next uh, change. On page two in lines nine to 10, initially consent had been the conjunctive knowing and voluntary. We recommended an or there instead based upon the statute now including distinct uh, theories uh, based upon someone being asleep or unconscious and not being able to, to consent. We felt that uh, knowing involuntary in that context could be a little bit confusing where um, you know, voluntariness is probably impossible when someone's asleep or unconsciousness. So it'd be somewhat surplus in that uh, context. And then of course, someone can't know if there's proof that they're asleep or unconscious. So we felt that it was better to be able to have the charging document make an election between demonstrating um, a lack of knowing consent or a lack of voluntary consent, uh, although those are two very closely related uh, principles. And uh, David Chair might be able to speak to that as well, as that was one of the issues that he had flagged and um, we worked through. Next, um, sort of a big one, recommendation two on the documents filed. So this is at page two, lines 12 to 14, and then page three, lines 18 to 19, uh, dealing with individuals who are suffering from a psychiatric or developmental disability. Uh, first, uh, all three of us, when we spoke, recognized that this is an incredibly important uh, protected class of people who are um, unduly exploited um, when it comes to sexual conduct and are a particularly high-risk group. However, uh, the legislature several years ago, when revising um, the vulnerable adult statutes, I think did a really good job of squaring up Section uh, 1379 when it discusses sexual exploitation of a vulnerable adult. Our concern was by the slight variation and difference in definitions that there'd really be two ways to charge the same conduct. The existing statute already accounts for both sexual acts, which include an act of penetration, as well as sexual contact or conduct that is not penetrative. So groping, touching, things of that nature. So since that statute is already 
we think in, in good shape and captures uh, what's necessary. It didn't necessarily make sense to embed that here. The military and federal laws from which uh, this was derived do, don't have an analogous vulnerable adult statute in that way. So uh, we felt I, that it was- I don't mean to interrupt. I can't, I don't know where you are exactly. You, you said where you were and I, I can't seem to find where you are on the that document. I apologize, Lori, but- Yeah, you thank so, you. Are you working off of your um, recommended revisions, the summary as opposed to the actual amendment, maybe? Yes, I was the I'm sorry, the uh, it was the original document that has the page line number. So let me I'll tell you right now where that is. Yeah, thank you, Martin. I was It, it would have been in the bill as introduced. It would have been under uh, subsection B, subdivision 2B. Is it not in this amendment or? or? No, it was eliminated. That's why I can't find it in the amendment. That is true. The, uh, when, I, when I submitted it, it was late last night when I submitted it and I had it highlighted and struck and then I sent it to editing and uh, they took all that out rightly so because I didn't tell them not to so <laughs> right. so for everyone's uh, purposes subpart uh, what used to be the subpart B said quote psychiatric or developmental disability and that condition is known or reasonably should be known uh, by the person and then the other the other impacted portion was yeah I mean I'm, I see it now on the in, as introduced uh, and that's page two line 12 to 14 right correct it was just the uh, definitions which then cross reference to uh, the same definitions used under um, title 13. Uh, section 1375 with the treatment of vulnerable adults. Uh, before I proceed on that, any uh, are there any other questions on on that? Okay. The next recommendation number. Recommendation number four is in the new document located. I apologize again, Rory. I'm a little slow on the uptake today. Um, just to, to summarize or confirm, you're fine with taking that out. And you just gave us the rationale for why you're fine with taking that out, right? Correct. OK, that's fine. You don't have to repeat yourself. I can go back and look at the YouTube if I need to, to hear it again. Thanks. No problem. Thank you. All right, so then uh, turning to the fourth recommendation, which is uh, under section three, dealing with trial procedure consent. That's on page three, lines 20 to 21. Formally, it included a more uh, robust definition uh, that was described as such, a current or previous dating, social or sexual relationship by itself or in the manner addressed to the person involved with the accused in the conduct at issue does not constitute consent. Uh, in speaking with both David and Dominica, uh, that is well established in existing uh, case law under the rape shield statute. And our concern was the legislature in the future may desire to add or modify rape shield in terms of what evidence is or is not allowed. This is maybe more of a construction and um, just keeping everything in one place argument for lack of a better way to put it it would make sense to spell out things within the rape shield statute rather than having it laid out both in the consent definition itself for in trial procedure and then in the rape shield statute. So we felt comfortable that a just direct cross-reference to remind that evidence that is prohibited under the rape shield cannot be used uh, for purposes of demonstrating uh, consent. And um, so it, nothing too radical there is just a function that it would make sense if the legislature intends to modify 
or clarify rape shield evidence, it should probably be done under section 3255, the rape shield statute itself. And the final recommendation we made was uh, with respect to the advisory committee uh, concerning uh, Title IX and campus um, sexual assault issues. And in that sense, um, we did feel that both uh, for the technical expertise that a sexual assault nurse examiner would be helpful to contribute to that. My personal experience with the multidisciplinary team of our special investigative unit in Washington County is that the same nurse contributes um, a really great voice about what is being seen on the front line of an emergent uh, sex assault crisis and uh, evidence collection issues. And then we also felt that um, a prosecutor either drawn from uh, the Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs or a representative from the attorney general's office would be appropriate. And I say that just to characterize, there are some things that are um, you know, concerning particularly about college sex assault. So we have, from an investigative standpoint, really two standards, if you will, uh, public universities and state colleges Incidents that occur on campus are investigated exclusively by the Vermont State Police. Uh, that's not the same uh, for um, private institutions where it's typically the local department or whoever has jurisdiction. So in some cases that may be Vermont State Police and others it's going to be a municipal uh, department. That said, um, from my standpoint in Washington County, there's sometimes um, a little bit difference in, in communication flow and the formality of reporting. And um, you know, we have concerns that sometimes, um, I'll just be direct, there have been several occasions where uh, victims who have made delayed reports to law enforcement made a near or contemporaneous report to Title IX and were under the mistaken belief that, that law enforcement would be informed, would be involved, and was part of that process. Uh, ultimately, uh, cases such as sex assault become increasingly difficult to prove at trial as physical evidence is lost or as uh, individuals outside the criminal justice system begin questioning, speaking with, or contacting witnesses or even directly uh, the alleged offender. So from that standpoint, we view that there's uh, a role to be had of a prosecutor's voice in, in that going forward to, to identify some of the ways in which cooperation can be improved and uh, ultimately a better, better investigative services and better services to victims offered upfront and early. Thank you. Any questions? Not, not seeing any. Michelle, do you want to uh, add anything before you go? Can you? <laughs> um, I just emailed everybody the link to the sexual abuse of a vulnerable adult statute so you could see what is in current law. And then I had sent you the language that was removed at the recommendation of prosecutors because of that existing statute. So you can kind of see that language. Um, and then I think the rape shield one is pretty explanatory. Um, uh, I think they feel as though that's already covered and you don't need to necessarily restate it and you just reference back. Um, I think Rory did a good job of explaining the or instead of the and, spe specifically as it applies to folks who may be um, uh, asleep or unconscious. And I don't know where they're at question or just confusion about any of the other provisions or uh, do you Tom, have a question? You Tom, you have your hand up, right? Yes, yes, I do this time. And I, I, I don't know if it's for Michelle, if she has to go, I'm sure Rory could answer it. But so in a situation where somebody's drugged and say they're, uh, they don't rise to the level of a substantial impairment, the, the, they, uh, there would still be a, a charge available under drugging somebody? Yes, and that's actually an important distinction is the language in subpart B1 remains just simple impairment versus substantial impairment. And that's premised on one that's existing law and two, it's premised on the notion that um, you know, intentionally trying to drug someone in order to advance uh, a sexual act is somewhat different. That's a specific design to uh, achieve that versus uh, the, uh, the second theory, which is taking advantage of someone who on their own accord has potentially become intoxicated or in that vulnerable state. Right, great, thank you. Okay, great, I'm not seeing any other hands. Thank you so much, Rory. 
appreciate I'll, I'll check back in. Okay, great. Later. Okay. Great. Appreciate your appreciate your work on this. Thank you. Uh, David Shear, Attorney General's Office, please. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and Committee. Dave, for the record, David Chair with the Attorney General's Office. I don't have a lot to add to what State's Attorney Tebow just testified about. I think he did a very nice job summarizing the changes and the uh, intention behind them. I'll add really only one small point around the or versus the and on page one uh, around the definition of consent. One of the concerns coming from our criminal division there was that when you add a term to a definition, uh, it may require a prosecutor to plead and prove uh, another set of facts or another fact. Uh, and this would specifically be relevant when a prosecutor is trying to show in a sexual assault case say a, one that's just charged under A1, uh, meaning just simply a sexual assault without the consent of another person, to take, the, to take an example, prosecutor may now have to prove under the prior proposal that there was, um, you know, there was some, that, that they had indicated that there was both not only, was there not voluntariness, there was also not knowingness. Um, and so there is a concern that all of a sudden, instead of having to show one of these uh, levels of intention uh, or, or states of mind, the prosecutor would have to plead and prove that there was the absence of both of these states of mind. And it was not entirely clear what that would mean. It's not entirely clear that that would happen, I, I acknowledge, but it was a concern that uh, our criminal division had in terms of unintentionally making a prosecution more difficult than it is currently. Uh, so that was just a technical aspect and we certainly agree with changing the and to an or because of that concern. And that was the only addition I had. Again, I think State's Attorney Tebow did a nice job summarizing the changes and the reasons for them and happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> any questions? No? Um, okay. <laughs> Not seeing any at this point. All right. Great. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. Uh, Sarah Robinson from the network, please. Good morning. Uh, Sarah Robinson, Deputy Director at the Vermont Network. Um, thank you again for taking up this very important bill. Just want to say that largely we are supportive of the recommendations that were brought forth by the State's Attorneys Association and the Attorney General's Office um, this morning. Certainly uh, very supportive of the language to um, in section one lines nine to 10 to move to knowing or voluntary agree that we don't wanna raise um, the current burden that the prosecutors face. Um, regarding the suggestion to remove the language uh, related to psychiatric or developmental disabilities um, because the vulnerable adult statute fulfills the intended purpose of that section. We don't have any significant concerns based on what we've heard um, in witness testimony this morning, but I would also say that I would defer to the disability and mental health rights community to possibly weigh in on that suggestion and whether the vulnerable adult statute is currently sufficient um, and that the language ought to be in fact removed. Um, and on the proposed modification to section three to reference Vermont's existing rape shield law. We support this change uh, and recognize that the rape shield statute is the product of many years of careful crafting. And so we certainly um, agree that it makes sense to reference that there. And finally, supportive of the uh, recommended additions to section five regarding the composition of the higher education sexual violence prevention council. Um, and we're what those are welcome additions and happy to have those, those uh, folks participate in that process. The last item I just wanted to note for the committee, I just wanted to respond briefly to some of the testimony that was received the last time the committee discussed this bill regarding section four on data requirements. Just wanted to highlight why this section is of particular importance to the network. What is abundantly clear in hearing from sexual violence victims is that despite some good outcomes, uh, the criminal legal system often does not meet the needs or contribute to a sense of justice, um, never mind healing or resolution for many victims. 
And this data will really help us understand how cases are moving through that system, um, not simply to point to future reforms, which are important, but also to potentially help us consider where alternatives to the traditional criminal legal response most uh, might be most useful to victims of crime. Um, and I know that there was some witness testimony that you all heard about whether there needed to be additional clarity uh, in section four about the data requirements. I just wanted to um, note that I'd be happy to discuss these concerns with the other witnesses and determine whether there ought to be any language recommendations that um, we could potentially make to the committee together. Thank you, appreciate, mm -hmm. appreciate that, thank you. Uh, Tom. Is section four listed as section five in this bill? Um, sorry, I was looking at the as. Because I'm going, as I was scrolling through, I went by section three and then, uh, and then on page five, it came, it says in section five. Uh, it is, let me, I'm just pulling up the draft as introduced where. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at draft 1.2. Yeah, I know 1.2 are instances of amendment. And so it's a little tricky going back and oh. forth. So I, um, I wonder if next time we should do a strike all and with highlighting or, or something because and have it all in one. Fair. Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. would appreciate that. Yeah. Section four in the bill as introduced. Right. All right. Helpful. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. I I um I think this was a people were working as quickly as, as they could and Michelle wanted to get us get us something and get something to the editors. And so I, I, um, I do appreciate what we have here, but, but I think next time around it would be helpful to, to do a strike call. Any other questions for Sarah? No. Okay, great. Thank you so Thank much, you. Sarah. Appreciate it. Uh, Rebecca Turner from the Defender General's Office. Good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you for having me back on this bill. Uh, I previously testified about the, uh, for the record, Rebecca Turner uh, from the Office of the Defender General's Office. So I, I previously testified uh, about uh, the Office of the Defender General's objections to an earlier draft of this bill the current draft that I've looked through today doesn't address the concerns that I raised at the earlier testimony and therefore we continue to object. And I just wanna highlight for this committee this morning, uh, again, the two primary areas where our concerns lie with this bill. Uh, first, and again, we I raised this earlier, the concern here with this bill is that it removes the mens rea requirement from a life imprisonment offense. And I just want to pause there because I just want this committee to realize that in the um, in this bill, it has removed the mens rea from a life imprisonment offense. I'll go into that uh, more in a second. The second area of concern is the definition of consent and how this bill effectively establishes a standard for proving consent by requiring an affirmative yes burden. And I'll go into that a little bit more. So first, removal of the mens rea requirement. I am looking specifically at every section of this draft, which uses the word should have known, reasonably should have known. And I can go through that now so that you can highlight it uh, with this current latest draft by pages. I'm starting with page two, line 10. We see our first reasonably should have known and in line 10, section four, it's established no person shall engage in a sex, sexual act with another person when the person knows, there's your mens rea, followed by the disjunctive or, or reasonably should have known that the other person, on and on and on. So by establishing the disjunctive or reasonably should have known, you have left it to the optional uh, discretion of law enforcement to charge a life imprisonment offense based on not whether an accused actually knows 
there was no consent, but whether a reasonable person should have known. And so I just want to highlight there because it's not just page two, line 10. It's also occurring page four. And this is subsection six. And this is where it outlines through A through E all of the situations when a person shall be deemed to have acted without the consent of the other person. New or, there's your mens rea, but or writes it out effectively. Or the least amount of conduct required, the least amount of proof that the law enforcement has to show, a reasonable person should have known. So again, it doesn't matter whether an accused knows. Now, why this is a concern, not just that it effectively makes it, um, removes a burden on the prosecution. It's a fundamental uh, principle in criminal law that we punish uh, based on the criminal culpability of the person who stands charged, uh, particularly when the penalty here is, is an extreme one, life imprisonment. Uh, we do not have effectively strict liability offenses with life imprisonment, and that's what's happened here. And in this situation, I think that if the legislature were to, were to pass this legislation, it would be an excessive exercise of this legislature's policing powers uh, to create offenses. It would be an excess and a violation of due process. The second basis, and turning to the definition of consent concerns, and how and what that translates to. I'm looking at page three. And let me get there because I've just flipped through my page three, lines 14, 15. You can start there. This is about defining consent. And the definition of what we understand consent is now presented in the negative. And there are lots and lots of lines describing in the negative what consent cannot be. And 1415 establishes lack of verbal or physical resistance does not constitute consent. So it's just pausing there under this bill, a sex partner's silence is not enough for consent. A person merely reading the moment and believing, knowing, believing your partner is actually consenting to having sex is not enough for consent. Instead, how I read this bill, and, and I don't see how you can read it any other way, uh, the, it would establish an affirmative, continuous yes requirement all the way through the sexual act. And then if the complainant were to later claim that there was actually no consent, the charge would be filed. And at trial, the defendant, the person accused would have to prove that there was actually consent. Now, what I've just described as is set up for in this bill is an effective burden shifting in criminal trial where the accused who is otherwise presumed innocent, right? where the state otherwise has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt of lack of consent, that this sets up a flip of those fundamental presumptions. And again, that's a violation of due process. Third, Staying with this understanding and this requirement of consent is requiring affirmative yes. In real life, I'm not sure how we can ever be completely sure under this bill whether the consent was sufficiently affirmatively yes. Yes now is still yes now is still yes now. And this is why in our criminal law, it's been required to have some affirmative evidence of a lack of consent. No means no, clear. When this bill, which flips this evidence to be proving yes means yes, now we've turned every encounter into sort of this forced situation where a person has to be detached, thinking with a lawyerly lens, right? Uh, whether or not this moment is, is, is clearly unequivocally a yes, and then continuing on so. And so I think that where the stakes are life imprisonment, where we cannot understand what an affirmative yes means under this, what is a sufficiently affirmative yes under these in these circumstances, it's insufficiently 
um, providing notice to a person who stands accused and overbroad and uh, vague. So putting this context then in what we know about how and the problems of overly vague, overbroad laws is that we give too much discretion uh, to the prosecution, to the police to enforce this law. When we give too much discretion to law enforcement to interpret these otherwise vague, vague terms, what do we do? We exacerbate exactly what we already are, know is a problem and are trying to fill fix X, S elsewhere. Uh, disparities in our criminal juvenile justice system. We know that black men, black boys stand particularly vulnerable to being subject to prosecution. And when you throw on these labels that are just open to interpretation by police, by prosecutors, I think the changes here, uh, while I understand the underlying good motive behind this bill, doesn't actually help the situation. Finally, turning to the last part of this bill, which is the creation of a council. I Actually, excuse me, I, I, oops, Martin, your hand went. I'll, I'll wait until uh, Rebecca's done. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, and my final comments as to the council, the latest draft has made changes to the membership of that council. My previous testimony raised concerns that the membership failed to provide fair and balanced membership by the suggested uh, addition of just a prosecutor uh, and, and of course uh, the nurse, um, the expert examiner that doesn't solve or address even a token gesture of a single seat towards someone who could represent um, the interest perspectives of someone who stands accused. The black men, black boys who are disproportionately uh, accused of these um, offenses, these circumstances, newly arrived uh, Americans or immigrants. And so again, just stress the recommendation that there be, if there is a council to be created, that representation from these BIPOC communities, public defenders, uh, others who would represent um, uh, these, these people's interests uh, should be included. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Martin. So, so going, going back to your um, issue, uh, page three, line 14, 15, uh, was the language as it was previously any better? It seems a little bit different. It seems like it's gone a little further with the uh, change from the lack of consent may be shown without proof of resistance. That, that language seems that there has to be something more than just uh, a lack of verbal, verbal or physical resistance, or is it not really any different in your view? Oh, Representative Lalonde, I'm going through my, my pages. Will you tell me again what okay, you're I'm sorry, page three, line 14 to 15. Page three, line 14. The amendment. Of the current bill. Yeah, of the draft. amendment, right, yes. It was, the part of, it was the part about lack of verbal or physical resistance does not constitute consent. That's... Well, that seems a little different than the language that was struck out. And, and do you have the same issue or a different issue with the language that was struck out? Uh, no, I, it's, it is the same issue. It's, does, it's not a substantively uh, significant improvement. Actually, I don't think it's any improvement uh, if I'm seeing the right drafts. Here. No, I was saying, or, and I'm saying that the language that was struck, is that an improvement over the language that we have that this new language in your view or is, or is it? Yes, no, I think this, right, yes, thank you. Uh, striking um, lack of consent of the show without proof of resistance. Um, yes, it I think seems that, that, that's that is still, sorry, that I do think that the addition of clarifying uh, physical, lack of verbal or physical resistance, um, it's, it's, they're both problematic, right? Um, again, again, it's going back to this, this definition of consent resting on an affirmative yes versus evidence of no, right? Um, and, the and, and the negative of consent being proven. Um, and again, I understand like there's, there's the public policies and interests in terms of avoiding um, non-consensual uh, circumstances and sexual encounters. I'm coming from the perspective of the criminal system where we're facing, and this is about life imprisonment. And so the, the, the level of, of, of notice that is required 
so that we do not inadvertently uh, commit these, these, this most serious offense uh, is why we need to change and be detailed. So no, I don't think it's, it, it, it substantively addresses either the original version or this new, the concerns. I appreciate that. Um, I guess the other questions I, I have probably are for the witnesses we've already heard from Rory and David. I appreciate what you were saying about the reasonably should have known. That does seem to put it into a, a different category. That's not your normal criminal offense, but but I, I'll save that question for uh, Rory and uh, David Shear. Uh, if we can, if if uh, Madam Chair, we can go back to them after. Yes, can uh, Barbara. Thanks. Uh, so Rebecca, I'm wondering um, two things. One is, what if it weren't a life imprisonment, a guaranteed life imprisonment sentence? It, you know, I was in preparing for my remarks this morning, I was reading a case that just came out of the Washington Supreme Court, uh, I think yesterday, where they invalidated a statute, a felony statute involving uh, drug possession. Yeah. And, and the reason they invalidated was because there wasn't a mens rea requirement. And the reason, the basis was a due process excessive exercise of policing powers because there, the lack of a mens rea for, I think it was a five year maximum felony was, was found uh, unacceptable and an excessive exercise. So there is an example, uh, even if the sexual assault statute had a maximum uh, sentence of five years, not life imprisonment, right. that wouldn't have been enough. And have you seen another state statute that you've thought was, um, sort of well put together. I haven't done a survey and, and come up with that uh, from that perspective. Um, but I appreciate the, the question and I am sure, uh, I, and I don't have the numbers in terms of how, uh, how many, how few jurisdictions are an affirmative yes uh, or proposing that. I, I do have a sense that, that we, that's in the minority. That, that the general, um, the majority, and again, I hesitate, but I do think uh, it requires an affirmative evidence of no, right? No means no versus flipping it to yes means yes. Right. Well, you, you raised some interesting points, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, I realize that um, it's noon and I know there are other things going on. I do just want to, um, I don't see Pepper here. So I'm gonna ask if uh, Rory, if you wanted to, um, to respond, please. Sure, so I'll keep the comments brief knowing, uh, stand between you and lunch hour again for the record. This is Rory Tebow, Washington County State's Attorney. Um, I'll start with this just general premise. So I think why there's a lot of friction with the issue of affirmative consent versus um, the more traditional view of there needs to be some sort of active no uh, on the part of somebody. I think recognition is this. In human nature, there are several responses to a traumatic event. Uh, we all know the, probably from kids were taught that there's a flight, fight or flight response. Um, so try to evade or, or fight back. But more commonly, I think we see the third one that is less frequently spoken about, which is freeze. Some people will stop and be unable to react in a highly stressful or traumatic situation. And that has been one of the issues that has continually bedeviled successful prosecution of these cases. Um, and that it's particularly exacerbated when someone's under the influence uh, or is incapacitated by a drug or an, an intoxicant. So to that end, um, I would also note I don't share the same due process concerns um, that Ms. Turner does. And I would note that both federal and military jurisdictions have used this standard for upwards of 10 years without it being challenged or overturned by either the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, which is the equivalent and has equal standing to a circuit court in the federal system. The Supreme Court has not taken opportunity to overturn these. Uh, the minimum standard we're dealing with here uh, of reasonably should have known with respect to intoxication 
is really equivalent to deliberate ignorance or willful blindness. Uh, courts have routinely, and especially in the federal uh, realm, have continually found this to be the equivalent to uh, a willful decision. When someone outright ignores what would be obvious to a similarly situated person in the circumstance, there is criminal liability for that. And it is in excess of what we'd consider reckless or wanton disregard, uh, which is uh, underpins our second degree murder statutes, uh, underpins reckless endangerment, and recklessness is already embedded as a mens rea in things such as domestic assault or other, other crimes. So that said, one of the materials that I provided uh, to the committee was the set of what effectively is jury instructions used by the military. It answers a lot of questions about how these things are actually applied. But I think it's important to note that the statute is the starting point. Every single criminal statute we have is backed by the Vermont Criminal uh, Jury Instruction Committee generating pattern instructions for courts to apply. That's a combination of both the statutory language and definitions and also existing case law. So I trust that the professionals on those committees, which includes representation from the defense bar of prosecutors and is chaired by a judge, will work through these issues successfully and adopt definitions that ensure the due process rights of uh, offenders while also uh, meeting the intent of the legislature to ensure we have an effective statutory regimen to respond decisively to instances of sexual assault. Final point that I would make today, there is no direct burden shift here. Rather, in existing cases and in future cases, it's a defendant's option if they want to assert a mistake of fact as to consent defense. That's at their discretion. And uh, we'll say from a prosecutor standpoint, we don't just blindly go forward on these cases. The last hearing we began with the sobering statistics of how many sex assaults there are, how many are investigated, how many are ultimately prosecuted, and how many actually result in conviction. There's a significant, significant drop off between the cases that are investigated and those that are prosecuted. And therein lies the art, um, if not exact science, of prosecutorial discretion. We often have to have incredibly difficult conversations with victims that assure that we believe them and yet highlight all the different reasons why we believe the evidence will not be sufficient to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. We do take into account what would appear to be reasonable or honest mistakes of fact. We do take into account considerations of past history, past relationship. This is again why cases involving intimate partners who've been together for years, including married partners, are often incredibly difficult to prove at trial. That said, the marginal and incremental changes made to both consent and other definitions here, I think are a more accurate reflection of the modern values about body autonomy and the rights of individuals in a sexual setting. So I'd encourage the uh, committee to adopt uh, H183. Thank you. Thank you. I see Martin has his hand up. Yeah, a, a, a couple questions. Uh, on the issue of the reasonably should have known, are there other criminal statutes that use that terminology that you're able to point to? Uh, that, that still concerns me, frankly. Uh, it seems to be going more towards a negligent standard. Uh, and I think it's different than willful or reckless disregard, which uh, I know that we have criminal offenses that look at that <clears throat> as a sufficient mens rea. Um, and following up with that, and you don't have to identify that right now, but if you can get back to me, I'd like to understand where else we've used that that standard. And the other question I have is why can't this be put in the terminology of willful or reckless disregard? Uh, and you don't necessarily have to answer that right at this moment either, but this does, this does concern me. I don't like uh, strict liability offenses or negligence offenses, uh, criminal law at least. Uh, it's not, it doesn't matter what I like or not, but it's disfavored generally in a broader, uh, broader extent. Uh, and, and the other issue that I, I also do see the trouble with the lack of verbal or physical resistance does not constitute consent. I, I think that we, that's still a little broad for my liking. And I think that that probably could be narrowed to really get at where you are, uh, where, where we want to be with this. Uh, but I do respect where uh, Rebecca Turner was uh, raising that as, as, as being awfully broad. Um, I don't know if you have comments on either of that. that. I'm just, I guess, highlighting a couple places where 
I think that there's some certainly legitimate concerns here. So uh, the most immediate answer to reason we should have known, I believe that both um, of our stocking statutes include an element that the individual should reasonably have known that it would cause the individual fear. So that is an existing standard uh, in Vermont. Uh, I'll look that up right now to give you a solid answer on that. Um, right. In terms of, you know, in terms of the second part, I don't. I won't take away that there is a significant policy question about where the legislature desires the line for consent to be. Um, you know, but I guess putting this in terms of a medical uh, procedure, if, if you were to just stay silent and a doctor comes and performs a procedure on you, did you consent to that procedure being done? Is silence, does silence equal acquiescence? I think that's a fundamental question that's driven a lot of uh, policy here. And um, I think what's incredibly important about the lack of physical resistance is this statute, new statute or new proposed language uh, directly accounts for circumstances where someone is unable or incapable of offering such resistance. And, you know, flipping it the other way around, uh, it, it is foreseeable and it could happen even under the existing statute that someone would use the defense of someone who's intoxicated and just laying there motionless, unable to verbalize. Well, she was asking for it. She didn't say no. And that we have seen and heard that in cases in the past. And whether that's a, you know, certainly from a moral standpoint, that's probably inappropriate. And I guess it's really for the legislature to determine whether that is a point where there should be criminal, you know, criminal liability. Uh, my personal viewpoint would be yes, that those are uh, circumstances. And there's not much that needs to be demonstrated to show some affirmation uh, what we'll typically hear is, you know, the person responds positively to some sort of, of touch, either wrapping a leg or caressing somebody, you know, I don't want to get too graphic and, and committee testimony, but there's often something, but the total lack of any affirmation it is troubling to suggest that there's um, agreement to go forward with that action. Right, but in this, but the scenario you just threw into that discussion was an individual being uh, intoxicated in some manner, and that that's a separate, separate situation. That's a a, a burden of proof that uh, one has to show that the individual you know, was a, a diminished capacity really to be able to consent, which is a little bit different. Um, I don't. Know, I, I I just I'm a little bit troubled by that, but by that particular provision so i can give one anecdote from a pending case in washington county we had a, a 16 year old who was victim of a sexual assault and uh, the main defense being offered is that she never said no um, this young girl reports in her statement being effectively terrified and freezing while in the car with this individual and just basically sat there um, one because she was isolated from family and friends and in a somewhat remote location and felt that she had no choice but to Yes, and I think that that's. Yeah, but isn't that, that a situation? I'm sorry, isn't that a similar situation of some sort of diminished capacity? But in that case, it's because the individual's terrorized, is freezing. That's again, is that something that can be captured in the, in the language in in here? Right, because yeah, I'd like to capture that as well. Problem is that this goes beyond that. I think. And you know, maybe it's just going to take some more more thought, or I'm just going to have to come around to this. But sure. The one thing I'll just add as a, to close the loop where I started. Uh, so, 13 BSA, section 1061, which defines what constitutes a course of conduct sufficient for stalking, does include reference to um, reasonableness, and, and specifically, stalk means to engage or purposely or engage purposely in a course of conduct directed at a specific person that the person engaging in the conduct knows or should know would cause a reasonable person to fear for his or her safety or the safety of another, or would cause a reasonable person substantial emotional distress. That, I'm gonna have to ponder that. That's somehow different scenario or situation, but I, I, it just doesn't seem to be exactly comparable to what we're talking about here, but I can't really articulate that right at the moment. I have to ponder that a little bit more. And maybe Rebecca Turner can also kind of ponder why this is different. 
Okay, I uh, see David, you've just uh, come on. Did you want to uh, add anything at this point? Sure, I'll, I'll be brief again. I know we're into lunch and, and uh, Attorney Turner may have a, a quick response also, but I did want to just address the issues around the burden in 3254, which in the latest draft is pages three and four. Um, my read of the changes there, uh, the second half of pages three in particular, is that it's not a real change from current law. Current law already says that lack of consent may be shown without proof of resistance. And I view the, the first three additions in particular there as basically elucidating that concept, uh, naming more specifically scenarios that are encompassed by the idea that lack of consent may be shown without proof of resistance. Um, so I don't actually view this as a, uh, a, a substantive change from current law. I view it as a clarification of current law. And I don't think that it switches a burden to a yes means yes requirement. The saying that lack of verbal or physical resistance does not constitute consent, um, it does not follow logically that the only way to demonstrate consent is through an affirmative statement. Uh, it certainly leaves plenty of room for other types of affirmation to be brought forward and to be um, potentially litigated if, if, uh, if it becomes a criminal case. Uh, so I don't think that we are moving to a yes means yes standard. I think we're basically staying at the current consent standard under current law. Um, and I think that there is room to um, allow for a variety of types of consent to be, or a variety of ways for consent to be demonstrated while also encompassing scenarios like the one that uh, attorney Thibault talked about in terms of scenarios where uh, things like silence should not be considered consent. And I think the that balance is in the current law and I think that balance remains in the proposal. Madam Chair, may I ask a question? Cause my hand didn't go down and I, 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 I can put it down and put it back up again, but. Um, go ahead quickly. Yeah. So, so on that language again, and um, page three, line 14 to 15, it still seems to me, and maybe I'm just, maybe it's late in the week, but it still seems to me that the language that struck uh, is different than, than this new proposed language, that lack of consent may be shown without proof of resistance. That tells me still that, that prosecutors still have to show lack of consent, whereas the lack of verbal or physical resistance does not constitute consent. That almost invites a situation where it's a lot easier for prosecution. Maybe, maybe it's is no significant difference between the two. But the way that I read the struck language is, again, I still think there's a burden to show lack of consent. It's not enough to say that this person just didn't resist. Uh, representative, again, I, I, I would view that differently. I don't think that you are significantly changing the current statute. I think that um, it, it certainly is the case that lack of consent will still need to be proven, um, just as it is currently. And that is going to be a burden that remains on the prosecution. All it's saying is that the lack of verbal or physical resistance uh, does not uh, disprove uh, consent automatically. Um, it's basically saying that the, the lack of that resistance uh, does not uh, make the person, you know, make the accused innocent, uh, but it still leaves. I think that's basically the same standard we have currently. So, so is that is that kind of essentially what we just dealt with in the um, uh, gay panic defense bill that we dealt with that we're essentially taking away a defense? We're saying, no, you can't use that as a defense. Is that kind of the equivalent? Again, Representative, I, it's my position here that we're not actually effectively changing the current burden, that we are elucidating it and describing more specific scenarios, but that uh, lack of consent still needs to be proven um, and lack of, 
you know, verbal or physical resistance is they're simply noting that that is not, that by itself does not constitute consent. That showing that is not enough to show that an alleged perpetrator is innocent. Something right. more needs to be shown. And I think that that is essentially the same as the current language. I appreciate that. Probably everybody else got that. And I just needed to have that pounded into my head a little bit more. I still have issues with the reasonably should have known part. And, and you know, we can circle back around to that some other time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. So I am going to um, stop here because uh, we are coming back in less than an, an hour. Um, and I want to give folks a chance to uh, get some lunch or have a break, whatever. Uh, okay, so thank you, everybody. Um, actually, before we adjourn, Sarah, do you have anything that you want to to say or anything or, or ask? Just want to, Sarah Copenhans is saying, just there's always more than one Sarah in the room, right? Um, no, I, I appreciate being able to listen in on the discussion this morning. Um, and thank you for working through these issues um, and for getting this right. Yeah, well, thank you. And definitely needs, needs some more discussion. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, let's uh, recess, uh, adjourn for the morning. Okay.